Because of the wind the night before, I laid out my swag on the river stones and slept under the stars. An extra bonus, lots of wind means no insects. As the sun came up, the Cruellas were once again fighting in the trees, preparing to spend their day looking for food. At Ivaminka, I booked a room in the hotel and went in search of the historical sites that lay along the banks of the Cooper Creek. Mr. Burke suffers greatly from the cold and is getting extremely weak. He and King start tomorrow up the creek to look for the blacks. It is the only chance we have of being saved from starvation. I am weaker than ever, although I have a good appetite and relish the nardu much, but it seems to give us no nutrients. Nothing but the greatest good luck can now save any of us. I may live four or five days if the weather continues warm. My pulse is at 48 and very weak and my legs and arms are nearly skin and bone. But starvation on Nardu is by no means very unpleasant, but for the weakness one feels and the utter inability to move oneself. For as far as appetite is concerned, it gives me the greatest satisfaction. Burke and King collected the Nardu seeds and pounded enough to last Mr. Wills for eight days. Before leaving, they placed water and firewood within his reach. Burke again asked Wills whether he still wished to be left behind, as under no other circumstances would he leave him. Wills told them he looked on it as their only chance. He then gave Burke a letter and his watch for his father, and they buried the remainder of the field books near the Ganya. Burke and King took with them enough Nardu to last them a few days, and started up the creek. I followed a long track that ended at a clearing where I found a signpost pointing 300 metres east to Burke's marker. With video, tripod and the SLR camera, I trudged through the sand. It was hot and the sweat flowed off me. I hope you will remain with me here till I am quite dead. It is a comfort to know that someone is close by. But when I am dying, it is my wish that you should place the pistol in my right hand and that you leave me unburied as I lie. Those words from Burke to King indicate the hopeless situation the men found themselves in. Twenty-eighth of June, eighteen sixty-one. That was the date that this tree was the last resting place for Burke. It was an expedition that had tragic consequences. The previous evening, Burke spoke very little, and the following morning, about eight o'clock, Robert O'Hara Burke expired. It must have been a terrible way to die after travelling all the way from the Cooper Creek right up to the Gulf 
and then returning, only to find that the camp was deserted. This area holds particular interest to me. I've followed the Burke and Wills expedition quite a bit, but to actually be at the tree where he leant against when he died, revolver in hand, is uh, quite a experience for me. It's tragic because just on the other side of this ridge here, there's abundance of wildlife. There's tons of fish in there, even a hundred and a hundred odd years later, people are still bring, bringing a good catch out of the Cooper. So it's amazing that they should die after doing such an epic journey. This whole area, the tracks are rough. There's sand going over the tracks all the time. There's an area heading down to Moomba where they've abandoned the track altogether because it's too hard to look after. King remained a few hours with his leader, but seeing there was no use remaining longer, he went up the creek in search of the natives. He couldn't find any of the local tribes, so he backtracked to Mr Wills, but found him lying dead in his ganya. It appeared that the natives had been there and taken some of his clothes. He buried the corpse with sand before tracking further up the creek. I decided to try to reach the spot where Wills died, but the track became too sandy and I nearly got bogged. Instead, I left the vehicle and hiked along the riverbank. half hour I've been walking along the banks of the Cooper. Hasn't been too hot but uh, flies are unbelievable. Where I'm trying to head is where Wills died. There's supposed to be a marker out that way. I tried to get to it by the track but the track's covered up with sand and all the way along here I haven't been able to find any tracks at all. And looking out that way, I've still got a long way to go to anywhere close to where he died. And the best I can come to, to actually show you where Wills died is down that way somewhere. King tracked the natives who had been to the camp by their footprints in the sand and went some distance down the creek shooting crows and hawks. The natives heard the sound of the gun and they came to meet him and he was taken back to their camp. They showed great compassion when they understood that he was alone on the creek and gave him plenty to eat. He often shot a few crows and hawks and gave them to him in return for their kindness. Every four or five days the tribe was surround King and asked whether he intended to go up or down the creek. In the end he made them understand that wherever they went he would follow. They were anxious to know where Mr Burke lay and one day when they were fishing in the water hole close by King took them to the spot. On seeing his remains the whole party wept bitterly and covered the corpse with bushes. After that, they treated King as one of the tribe. Nearly six months passed until one day, while the tribe had been out fishing, they returned to tell King that the white fellows were coming. King was taken over the creek where he could see the party coming through the bush. This blaze was cut on a tree which grew near this spot to mark the general location of which John King, a member of the ill-fated Burke and Wills expedition, was found living with Aborigines in 1861. The blaze was cut in about 1947. For many years, it was the only marker to this historic site. The story of King is a remarkable story 
It's a story that's quite incredible that anybody could be found out here in the wilderness by some people from down south. Unlike the lucky story of King, the rest of the expedition was a tragic comedy of errors. A numerous amount of things went wrong and a lot of it was just bad luck. At one point, a large number of natives had gathered on the opposite bank and they were shouting vigorously, at the same time pointing further down and waving their arms in a most excited manner. While Howard was following what appeared to be fresh camel tracks, he left instructions with Welch to continue down the creek. A dense body of natives between three and four hundred strong were seen to be massed in a wide sandy bed of the creek. Welch at this time was a few hundred yards in advance of the main party, which is not visible on account of the intervening timber. Not understanding the display of force and doubting its specific intentions, he decided to halt until the others arrived. But his horse took a distinctly opposite view of the situation. With a sudden rush, he headed straight for the gathered tribe. The natives, still shouting and waving their weapons, withdrew backwards to the opposite bank, leaving one forlorn-looking figure resembling nothing so much as a scarecrow standing motionless on the sand. As Welch approached, the figure sank to a kneeling position, threw up his arms in an attitude of prayer and toppled over as if dead. Welch jumped from his horse, he excitedly queried, In God's name, who are you, and where did you come from? After a short interval, the answer came in muffled tones, It's King, the last of the exploring expedition. Bray asked, Then where are Burke and Wills? In a wild burst of tears, the answer was, Dead, both dead, take me away with you. Welch fired two pistol shots into the air, which was the signal for help, which soon brought assistance from the other men. They carried King up the bank, formed a camp and dispatched one of the native trackers to bring Howard to the scene. A small tent was pitched. The doctor washed and scrubbed King down with brandy and remained with him until he collapsed in a violent fit of weeping and then went quietly to sleep. The next day, King started to tell his story to Howard. The contents of that narrative I have related to you throughout this video. I followed a long windy track that took me to the waterhole, believed to be the deepest on the Cooper Creek. It was here that the relief party led by Howard camped while looking for Burke and Wills. There weren't as many flies at this part of the river, which made it an enjoyable break in exploring. I spent the time relaxing in the quiet surrounding, cooking food and drinking lots of water. It's been a pretty good day today, it's been hot, but I got to see Berg's grave, also I was happy to see where King was discovered, 
I am a bit disappointed because I didn't get to see where Wills died, but I'm afraid that's going to have to be another occasion. Shaping up to be a pretty good evening tonight. Ready to have a campfire on the other side of the tent. But at this stage, people have just given me some fish, so I'm going to cook some fish up tonight. A bit of decent food instead of canned food for a change. Must admit I haven't been eating well. And this is mainly because I, it's been so hot, but I've been drinking a lot. Not just beer either. I've been going through at least two or three litres of water a day. And the flies, the flies are unbelievable around here. The isolated oil loop was north of Indominka and we were travelling through a similar landscape that Burke, Wills, King and Gray traversed on their up journey to the Gulf of Carpentaria in 1860.